Welcome to everybody from the campus of the Middlebury Institute of International Studies here at Monterey, California. Uh, it is about 12.15 right here in California, but I believe we have people from at least three, possibly more different time zones, including our speaker, Dr. Arya Levite, Eli, who is now in Israel, where the time is about 10 o'clock in the evening, a little bit after 10 o'clock. So we are surely grateful and appreciative for being with us at this late hour. It is a personal pleasure for me to uh, moderate and to host this webinar with Ellie. First, Ellie is a truly close friend. We have known each other, I believe, for at least some 35 years from the time from the mid 1980s, uh, after we both returned to Israel following completion of our PhDs in the United States, Elliot Cornell and myself at the University of Chicago. At that time, we were both junior faculty members at Tel Aviv University. And actually, Elliot, I remember, I think the first time that we met on the bus, I think it was bus 24 from the university to, to Ramat Sharon. And I think it was then that we met for the first time, maybe 84, 85, something like that. In any case, the friendship endures decades as Ellie still lives in the same neighborhood where I grew up as a kid and where my mom still lives there. Every visit in Israel, we spend at least one or two weekly late night walking some three or four miles in the fields around the neighborhood. And for some people who ask me, how did I lose my weight? Well, the answer is walking with Ellie helps. Ellie is currently a non-resident senior fellow in cyber and nuclear policy at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace for about a decade, where he has written important policy papers. But Ellie is a unique Israeli case of a scholar and practitioner. As an academic, he has written books and many academic articles on various aspects of international and regional security. And as a practitioner, he held some key senior government position in Israel including Principal Deputy Director General of the Israeli Atomic Energy Commission and earlier head of the Bureau of International Security and Arms Control in the Israeli Ministry of Defense and other positions. Next year, in January, Eli will spend some time at the Woodrow Wilson Center as a policy fellow, developing some fresh ideas on the idea of nuclear threshold, which is not irrelevant to the talk tonight. So his talk tonight, is uh, about Iran. And it's interesting that there were many papers that were written by many people about various aspects of the Iranian nuclear program, but very few people were trying to give some sense, some interpretations of the unique narrative, the unique path that characterized the way that Iraq's, Iran's nuclear program has, has pursued. So that's what's going to be the topic today. And with no further ado, Eli, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Avner. Thank you, Bill, for the um, invitation and the opportunity. It's a personal and professional pleasure to do so at um, CNS. Um, my talk, as Avner has said, would try to put the nuclear program in context, the Iranian nuclear program in context, and will essentially be built around two parts. First part uh, would be um, Iran program as such. And the second part of my presentation will try to put the whole thing in context and try to reflect on some of the broader implications that flow from the contours and the challenges presented by the Iran nuclear program, uh, which I would submit is merely the tip of an iceberg of a, of a much broader uh, challenge. So that's what I'll try to do in 30, 35 minutes and then open the floor for um, a genuine dialogue with you all, try to address as many questions as we can accommodate within the time allotted to us. I think it's obvious that I've been out of government now for quite a while and I've never, even while in government, I was quite in a free spirit. So I'm not gonna try and, and, and present an Israeli viewpoint, uh, let alone represent the Israeli government's view. And in fact, my presentation would not primarily focus on the immediate policy implications um, for Israel and the United States, but more broadly on some of the conceptual challenges that we're looking at. But if you wish to get into any of those very policy recommendations in the course of the Q&A, I'm at your disposal. 
So without further ado, let me let me um, go over the um, go over a handful of slides and and um, try um, try share with you my thinking. Um, the first half of the um, a presentation will cover largely the ground that I've covered in a recent article that I published that um, by the same name that appears on the Carnegie website. The second one will actually take you a few steps beyond it that, and reflect my current thinking of the broader implications. So um, let me find out the presentation. Okay. All right. Can you see the presentation? Good. All right. So. Um, Okay, my argument is basically, and, and this is essentially going to be the only very technical part of, the, uh, of my presentation. My argument basically is that if we now look historically, we can see essentially four phases um, in, the, in the evolution of the Iranian nuclear program. And I'm talking about the Iranian nuclear program as we had seen it since the Islamic revolution, is distinguished from what happened under the Shah, which calls for a separate discussion uh, in and of itself. So until late 2002, and I think which, as was adequately represented in the national intelligence estimate and so on, we have had a full-fledged covert nuclear weapons program that is vaguely resembling the, the Manhattan Project, namely very concrete, very project-oriented, very time-pressed, very ambitious in nature uh, and clearly very secretive. Again, as was, I think, adequately captured in the estimates as a, after the US, after the revelations of the, the Iranian program, after the US invaded Iraq, uh, after the uh, Israeli Libyans gave up on their nuclear ambitions and so on, there was some profound change in the nature of the program. It was no longer a Manhattan style project. And while there were different phases within this period between 2003 and 2014, where initially the Iranians had reassured themselves that the, um, that the suspension of some activities was going to be quite temporary in nature, and uh, then pro proved to be a more long lasting. And finally, they began to encroach on those and some of that suspension as part of the negotiations and until they collapsed. I think the, the most important takeaway with respect to the second period is that while Iran gave up on some aspects of its nuclear weapons pursuit, um, and, and the program no longer had all the, the elements of a genuine nuclear weapons program, the program did retain uh, elements of a cautious nuclear hedging posture, namely retaining the capability to resume the program and uh, gradually uh, enhance the credibility of such an option by doing some more work on fissile material, some more work on nuclear and missile delivery, uh, and some infrastructure construction. The period uh, that um, uh, of the, the diplomatic negotiations that started with the JPPOA, but more fundamentally with the JCPOA in 2015 to 2018, represented another step in capping the program, where many of the activities that were not kept, kept under this uh, period between 2003 and 2014 were kept. Most importantly, the fissile material stocks, some of the development of, of enrichment activities and so on. And there was also supposed to be a fair amount of activity on converting some of the facilities, the heavy water reactor, the, um, the deep underground enrichment activity and so on. And so again, uh, in, in ways that are not completely dissimilar to what happened in 2003, there was a further suspension of some of those activities, but by agreement of a temporary nature, and that those activities were going to become legitimate again after a while, and there were going to be phases in which the Iranians were, would be allowed to resume some of those activities. So and dur during this period, the Iranians continued to sustain the, the knowledge, 
you know, this this archive that Israel stole from our, from Iran, the documenting the program was clearly one bit of evidence uh, of that knowledge conservation. The teams that had worked on some key aspects of the program were kept together. The infrastructure was maintained and so on. But some of the most uh, worrisome activities were suspended. And finally, during this period, uh, Iran, notwithstanding a Security Council resolution that called on Iran to also suspend its dual capable missile program, Iran uh, didn't consider that uh, commitment to be something that is bound for and therefore continue to de develop the delivery capability. I'll get to the implications of that uh, a bit later. And finally, once the US withdrew from the JCPOA in 2018, and after a, a period of some uh, soul searching and procrastination, by 2019, the Iranians began to scale up their activity to win themselves off some of the JCPOA obligations and constraints to stall on the effort to try and reassure the IEA about their past activity, but also some of their present activity to continue to conceal some activities, including uh, in key areas, some violation of safeguards where they, where they had to, for example, under Article 3.1 to declare some future activities which they did not declare. They clearly, um, um, notwithstanding the closure of the PMD file, were required to report on fissile material activities um, dating back, which they haven't done, and, and things of that nature. But perhaps most worrisome was not just the resumption of those activities, but the practical uh, um, advance towards proximity to a fissile material threshold. And if the JCPOA originally was supposed to keep Iran away, one year away, from a material threshold, um, the, 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 um, the pace of progress of Iran on enrichment has brought down that period to anywhere around six weeks or thereabouts and shrinking by the day because of the deployment of more advanced centrifuges that, have, um, that are more efficient by an order of say four. And, uh, um, but just as noteworthy, the proximity, the approaching the fissile material threshold was not accompanied by and large with making parallel progress as was the case prior to 2003 on some other elements of the program, namely particularly the weaponization and militarization side. I'll get to the implication of that in a minute. So what we're seeing is Iran reaching for a fissile material threshold, but not the other elements of the program. Finally, uh, what we have seen since 2019, uh, some, some efforts prior to 2019, but also intensified effort uh, after 2019, and particularly intensified in light of what the Iranians had experienced as a way of efforts to sabotage their program, significant effort to harden the program for survivability. In two respects, one is reinforcing its deterrence by trying to build a missile launch capability across the region in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, and in Lebanon to deter any military attack. And the other parts have been to try and, and go more uh, towards facilities that are buried deeply underground and so on, and therefore less vulnerable to an attack. So what we are seeing is different phases in the evolution of the program throughout that period. What cuts across them was that the program was never truly peaceful, was never fundamentally transformed in terms of its general long-term orientation, but nevertheless, there were significant changes that occurred over time, some reassuring, some more worries. Let's now try and put things in perspective. What, in my judgment, has fueled the drive forward and what has held Iran back from actually pursuing nuclear weapons? I would submit that there are four elements or four factors that had driven Iran forward 
to pursue nuclear weapons. The first, I think, would argue is deeply cultural and cultural in multiple senses of words, that the Iran uh, um, is manifesting a combination of profound anxiety bordering on what I would submit is, is an element of paranoia, but also an element of grandiose self-regard that ultimately combine to uh, um, provide a, a path forward. And the path forward is, is, um, is essentially driven by a deeply rooted sense of historical victimhood, which is Shia going back to the 17th century, is Persian because we have already seen it with the Shah and so on, but it's clearly been heightened under the Islamic regime. The second uh, factor that has fed into this, uh, into, into this feeling has been uh, um, two developments that have been repeatedly referred to by the Iranian leadership namely witnessing what happened to Muammar Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein once they gave up on nuclear weapons was a sobering lesson of why you shouldn't give up on nuclear weapons pursuit or at the minimum of a nuclear weapons hedge. The third uh, was that the Iranian uh, um, feeling was that they are entitled, consistent with their vision of grandeur with their perception that their security stretches all the way from Central Asia to the Mediterranean, with their ambition to, to play a role in the international scene and so on. And so if India has nuclear weapons and Pakistan has nuclear weapons and in their belief, Israel has nuclear weapons and so on, there is absolutely no reason, and North Korea, of course, there is absolutely no reason that they shouldn't be entitled to be on the same path. And perhaps this part that gets the least attention of the lot, but I think is quite profound in its implications. What ultimately brings all the world powers to spend years talking to the Iranians? What provides the Iranians the capacity to humiliate the United States by keeping the US chief negotiator in the basement, refusing even to talk to them, and everyone paying attention to every statement that is coming out from Iran. So the, the, the nuclear negotiations experience originally and subsequently fuels the Iranian perception that having nuclear diplomacy around Iran with Iran of the six parties uh, ongoing actually reinforces the standing of Iran and puts Iran on kind of an equal footing with all the world major powers. So in that respect, Iran is in even more privileged situation than North Korea, because this is a sustained process and the Iranian minds, uh, um, Iran stands to benefit from prolonging the process and so on. But to prolong it also means that there ought to be some issues on the table that attract the attention of the world and therefore, and some, some leverage that comes with it. But as you might be able already to tell, this doesn't have the hallmarks of a sense of urgency. Whereas the Iran manifested a sense of urgency after the Iran-Iraq war, in line of the perception that the world had basically sided with Iraq against Iran, looked the other way when Iraq was using chemical weapons against Iran and so on, that Iran had to sacrifice some of its future uh, uh, generations on the battlefield to try and save itself uh, in, that, in that situation. As the year went by, the sense of strategic urgency has dissipated. So we, the, the, if you wish, the process that led Iran to pursue a Manhattan style project until 2002, uh, driven by a sense of urgency, um, had some of that sense of urgency uh, uh, dissipate, not just because of the pushback, but because of the memories of this experience beginning to recede. Not disappearing, but the sense of urgency was somewhat receding. So that's one. The second aspect that I think is largely undiscussed in the literature, 
is that Iran is deeply wedded to a culture, particularly this Iran of today, is deeply wedded to a culture of strategic patience and endurance. You do not look for immediate gratification. What counts is or you're on the way, you can wait for generations for the 12th Imam to come back. You don't have to achieve it on your, in your lifetime as long as you make some progress towards your ultimate goal. So some of the moderation in the pursuit of nuclear weapons is actually consistent and I would say inspired by this perception that what counts is more patience and endurance and, and, and rather than immediate accomplishment and gratification. And clearly uh, this goes hand in hand with a very traumatic experience, which basically says, don't push things too, too far, or in other words, risk aversion. To be more uh, nuanced here, because I think there is an, an important element here, Iran would engage repeatedly in saber rattling and brinkmanship. But at the end of the day, the, this leadership that we have seen in Iran for quite a while now is not risk inclined. So they are, if you wish, good bazaari merchants, and yet they will hold back from pushing things to the extreme. And I think the program demonstrate that risk aversion in terms of the things, not just things you would do, which keeps you on track, but things you would refrain from doing that would provoke others to take more drastic steps. And the final element, partly inspired by the previous elements, but also going beyond it, is that the leadership is divided. Some people's vision is Iran integration with the world. Some actually see it more as reorientation towards the East because of the demise of the West and so on. They, they, so, so not only are these, was the leadership consistently divided about what type of Iran they wish to see, they were also divided about where nuclear weapons fit into the equation and how risky some of these pursuits would be, would be. And while there is a whole body of literature discussing how real the fatwa is or not, I'm actually one who is inclined to believe that the current supreme leader has been largely since 2002, a codifying a policy of ambivalence in the fatwa, namely be on track, don't push it, and you don't need to actually have the bomb, the sort of your possession of the bomb. It's enough to be in a position where you can actually acquire it should the circumstances change. All right, what seems to be changing now? I would submit that there are five things that are beginning to change, all of which are a cause for concern. One is, I've already talked about the risk aversion. My interpretation of what's going on at the moment is that the Iranians are perceiving the risks in approaching the threshold. And, and I'm talking here specifically about the fissile material threshold. Let there be no misunderstanding that the risk in doing so are significantly diminished. If one was taking the, uh, uh, the speech of the prime minister of Israel, Netanyahu at the time, as defining what would be the red line that would trigger uh, military action, and largely, in, which largely also inspired the US red lines as they were put in place in the JCPOA, Iran has encroached on them significantly since 2019, largely with impunity. Impunity in the sense of no more, uh, more, no more aggressive sanctions or other actions compared to what it was witnessing before. So the Iranians believe that the red lines that were drawn in terms of interpreting what it may not be allowed to do because it was considered resumption of a nuclear weapon aspiration have gone away. And that is not just true in terms of approaching the threshold, but it is also in terms of playing games with the IEA, denying access, procrastinating and providing responses, lying to the IEA and so on and so forth, as has been documented repeatedly by the reports of the director general, including very recently. 
I think the second thing is heavily inspired by the perception of Iran uh, of a, a U.S. administration that is eager to pull away from the Middle East, to pivot towards Asia, to address domestic issues, the pullout from Afghanistan, and so on. I think the Iranians are identifying an opportunity, regardless of whether it's codified in the diplomacy or it's codified in unwillingness to challenge them, otherwise, to legitimize the hedge, a more advanced hedge posture, hedging posture than they have agreed to, uh, sort of uh, uh, had previously. I do think that there is also an element where the Iran feels more of a need for a nuclear hedge because of the instability in the region, because uh, some of their nuclear aggression in the region is being challenged. So not only is there an opportunity, but if you wish, there is also if, a, a desire and I would submit even a necessity. A further element is that uh, a key part of the negotiations has been uh, to, to sort of in over the last year has been uh, um, an effort to try and bring Iran back into the JCPOA. And the Iranians manifest a deeply, deeply felt distrust, which I submit is actually genuine, that the US would consistently stick to its side of the deal. And, um, and, and I think there are two elements there. One is kind of enduring, and that professes the, the deep enmity and distrust of the supreme leader in US policies. But I think it's fueled further in the deep internal divisions in the United States, in the perception that there is a very real possibility that come uh, 2022 and the congressional elections would bring into the uh, into Congress at least a more uh, hawkish uh, a political uh, party uh, in terms of its policy towards Iran. So the, the feeling is that even if the US were to accommodate Iran demands on, on sanctions, the US cannot be trusted to stick to its side of the deal um, uh, beyond it. The next issue, which was quite profound in bringing Iran to the negotiating table in 2013 and subsequently to conclude the deal in 2015, was the feeling that the sanctions were biting so badly that Iran had really had no choice but to negotiate and furthermore negotiate from a position which the Iranians hate, negotiate from a position of weakness. Although the general Iran uh, economic situation is far from being great. And Iran is also suffering from the combination of corruption and climate change, which is biting and, and, and biting very um, hard on Iran um, and, and, and um, COVID and so on and so forth. I think that what the Iranian leadership presently feels is more optimistic that they can actually sustain what they call the resistance economy, that it's viable, partly fueled by higher oil prices, partly fueled by the fact that the US isn't keen to reimpose the drastic sanctions on Iran in oil exports that have grown dramatically over the past year, partly fueled by the um, willingness of China and Russia to defy, uh, to defy um, US economic pressure and so on and partly fueled by the perception that Iran can subdue uh, the opposition and, and repress, um, as we've seen in Ahwaz and other places and so on, namely the resistance economy is not just economically viable, but politically acceptable. And the final element that I think seems to be changing is not only have we seen a change of, of president, which is of modest relevance in Iran, given the overwhelming importance of the supreme leader, but given that there is a widely uh, felt, uh, um, uh, widely felt uh, opportunity or necessity to, um, to bid for who would succeed the supreme leader, there is more to be gained from positioning yourself to do it on the right than on the moderate side, particularly in light of the discreditation 
of the more moderate elements as part of the collapse of the JCPOA in 2018. So what all of these elements are basically suggesting is that what we had seen between 2018 and the present is unlikely to produce a more accommodating Iran in terms of the nuclear negotiations, not even going back to the JCPOA. Okay, so with that type of background, let me spend just a few minutes on, on, on sharing with you a few reflections. And my reflections are trying to take the Iran case and put it in kind of a broader context. So the first, and I think the most important point, and Bill had repeatedly asked me to be a little bit provocative. So I will, uh, of course, never defy Bill Potter's requests. But here, this is a genuinely felt uh, belief, and I hope will provoke a, a question or a comment for Bill down the road. Um, excuse me for personalizing it, but Bill is such an important, uh, um, as, in, as sort of as, as an important uh, force in our in our discipline. So, so the, the, I think the most important thing is I, I would submit that Iran presently presents a more acute challenge to the non-proliferation regime than DPRK. DPRK is a nuclear weapon country. Everyone is kind of pushing, putting it aside. We all try to somehow live and coexist with Iran, with, with the DPRK. We haven't gotten to the point yet that we are willing to accept the same thing for Iran. And we are also inclined to believe that what would happen with Iran is bound to have not just an effect on its immediate neighbors, Turkey, um, Egypt, the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and so on, but would actually have a, even more profound implications on the broader non-proliferation regime. So that's point number one. Point number two is that I think that the Iran is now pursuing a path that is quite similar to the DPRK. There are a few steps behind, but I think the trajectory is quite similar. And I put in front of you some of those elements that I would submit, put them more or less in the same category. Again, bearing in mind that both of that Iran is a few steps behind, but I think the compass is a DPRK compass that basically says two things, what to pursue and the fact that you can get away with it. And, and perhaps more worrisomely than the others, beyond a certain point, people give up on a, on a genuine effort to roll you back and more or less leave to coexist with you and tinker with some suggestions of, you know, giving it back, but, but in essence, basically leaving you alone. I think the third element that we need to, and perhaps, uh, um, perhaps the most contentious of the, the argument that I'll make today is that the JCPOA can no longer be reconstituted if reconstitution means that it would yield anything even remotely resembling the 20, 2015 non-proliferation gains. Now, I wish to underscore here two points. The first is, I thought that JCPOA had some very good elements, some, uh, uh, some bad elements, and some ugly elements, which I tried to, to write about shortly after the JCPOA was concluded. But my point is, is not that the JCPOA was imperfect, which we can debate why it was imperfect, but why, why it was nevertheless, at least in my judgment, worth having. And I'm talking here within the four corners of the deal, leaving aside the regional ambitions of Iran and so on. My point is that even if you're willing to settle for what the JCPOA was able to accomplish in 2015, it's no longer viable to do uh, in the sort of if the goal as it was, was to keep Iran one year away for fissile material breakout. Impossible to reconstitute. Iran now has the knowledge and the capability to do so much further, and there is no way of practical way of getting pushing them back to anything even remote, remotely resembling this one-year breakout time on fissile material. And perhaps the most intriguing aspect of what I want to lay, lay in front of you is not that the JCPOA 
should be the only way of trying to cap the Iranian program and pursue diplomacy. It is to say that nobody has thus far come forward with an alternative viable framework that would offer any hope of regaining uh, and let alone sustaining any Iran any Iranian nuclear restraint that would be meaningful. And let me go uh, a little bit deeper into this issue. So, and, and I do so to a large extent with an eye towards the broader picture rather than an Iran specific picture, much as it's, we're talking here about the Iran uh, very much. So the number one is, we used to think that the principal barrier to nuclear thresholds is fissile material threshold. I would argue that this is largely out of the window. And I would submit between us that the largest culprit there is the United States. The, the Australia, uh, UK, US agreement is just the latest manifestation of that attitude. We have seen that with an Indian deal and then with an effort to bring India into the um, nuclear supplies group. We have seen that in the 2010 resolution of the nuclear the non-proliferation treaty uh, and so on. Uh, we have seen that with the, uh, the uh, going away of the gold standard uh, for provision of nuclear technology uh, as it was manifest under the Trump administration with Saudi Arabia. I could go on and on with the list. The US is not the only one, the only culprit here. But on the whole, the fissile material barrier is not, which used to be for very good reasons, the principal barrier we put in front of those countries is dramatically eroded. It hasn't gone completely gone away. And maybe they're here and there, there are elements of trying to resusc resuscitate some aspects of it. And we won't have the time now to actually go into ways in which this could be done. But on the whole, the US conceded the rights for enrichment, by the way, not in the 2013 JPOA, but in the 2015 JCPOA, and clearly would not be able to, re to, put, uh, to, to put it back into this uh, Pandora box uh, in 2021 or 2022 gone. So the legitimacy for indigenous enrichment is no longer linked by anybody to requirements, presumably peaceful requirements. And LEU accumulation isn't uh, any, any longer a condition. And enrichment to 20% is no longer unacceptable. And casting of uranium metal is no longer seen even though the IEA is crying foul, casting of uranium metal is no longer seen as something which is totally unacceptable. An engagement of indigenous enrichment R&D and centrifuge production, even if it's not economically viable or necessary, is also no longer seen as unacceptable. And the knowledge is widespread, the sophistication is growing, and the timelines associated, therefore, with early warning based on fissile material. Uh, um, the facilities and equipment abound, not just in Iran, but in the market. The pace of commissioning nuclear enrichment facilities, breathtaking. And here we're not talking about the most sophisticated industrial states and so on. We had seen the North Koreans going in that direction, the Pakistanis going in that direction, and, and so on. And I'm not. I'm trying to be as factual as possible rather than pre presenting to you a value judgment. Putting all of this in hardened facilities is becoming more common. And to me, perhaps the most worrisome aspect is largely the equanimity with which we have accepted playing games with the IA safeguards, denying access to, this, to, to inspectors, cleansing facilities prior to inspections, providing misleading information and so on. Read one report after the other of the IEA Director General Crime Foul, that it's happening, it's happening over time, it's happening across the board and so on. And you can't even get a board of governor resolution around it. And what furthermore, all of those developments around the fissile material, 
are happening without any core any any countervailing pressure to add more requirements to those who wish to undertake some of those activities so universality of the digital protocol looks hopeless additional conditionality or requirements as part of safeguards are not uh, are not in the cards and so on so there is no corresponding elements in the fissile material realm which are uh, um, propelling uh, um, propelling the non the nonproliferation uh, uh, restraint to actually uh, uphold the fissile material uh, threshold in any meaningful way but what is more important is that alongside these worrisome developments on the erosion of the fissile material threshold, we are seeing that the international community has not developed corresponding verification or restraint regime around any of the other elements of a nuclear weapons program. So one could argue that this is not the end of the world if countries exercise their what they argue are their rights under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, not just to have a peaceful nuclear energy program, but to operationalize it by ex extensive indigenous activity in the fuel cycle domain, even when it's not, whatever, commercially warranted uh, or warranted and so on. So we don't have any serious constraints on acquisition of nuclear capable delivery vehicles of any kind. Um, we are seeing uh, a lot of developments that are blurring the lines between different missile and other uh, uh, um, delivery vehicles uh, developments. And we're seeing a very uh, um, largely unsuccessful effort to stem the tide in terms of international collaboration uh, over uh, missile and dual capable missile development. And as if this is not enough, if anyone recalls that a couple of years back, we put out this report of the Carnegie Endowment based on a six year effort of lots of good nuclear experts, we have divided nuclear weapons program into four components. One was the fissile material activity. The other one was the delivery capability. The third one was nuclear militarization. And the fourth one, weaponization and system integration. My point here is that there hasn't ever been any evolution of any similar restraint or verification regime to deal with the two other aspects as well. So if we talk about militarization, and militarization is important because having studied numerous nuclear weapons program, it became clear that about five years before the, the countries acquire nuclear weapons, they begin to work on safety, and security and, um, and permission action links and training and doctrine development and infrastructure development that develops the capacity to ultimately control, launch, <clears throat> deploy nuclear weapons. There is nothing that is happening in that realm. I'm not talking about Intel. I'm talking about restraint and verification regime. And finally, there is nothing out there and here I'm talking about the restraint and verification regime. I'm not talking, for example, about the state level concept as the IEA is trying to work to do as kind of part of its analytical processes or what's happening in the ICs. The weaponization and system integration work are not being checked. There is no prescription on those activities. There is no verification regime uh, and so on, let alone the fact that some of them are dual capable and so on. The only effort since the Iraqi, uh, um, uh, the UNSCOM, uh, UNMOVIC experience that had tried to deal with those issues has been section two of the JCPOA and it has never been implemented. And we can discuss why, why that is the case. But that was the only effort to come to grips with this challenge and it's dormant. So, uh, um, so although this is, if you wish, the most indicative part of a nuclear weapons aspiration, even more so than fissile material acquisition, this here we have absolutely nothing in our hands 
to build a norm around or to create institutions that will ultimately verify it. So let me conclude. My, my bottom line is as follows. We are uh, facing a situation where advanced hedging posture um, based to a large extent on fissile material possession, but also some activities in the fissile material in the, um, in the delivery uh, uh, capabilities, as well as quite a few activities that are dual or, tri or triple use in the weaponization and system integration uh, and so on, are now within reach and capable of sustaining based on whatever pretext, if you actually have to give one. That we don't have in place any monitoring verification regimes that are designed or authorized to address this intersection. That even more worrisome, the non-proliferation is no longer a primary policy preoccupation. I think the, the Australia, the Australia, uh, UK, US deal is just one indication where that was not the primary consideration. I'm not saying that non-proliferation has gone down the tube entirely, but it's not an overriding consideration. It wasn't with India <clears throat> and it's not with Iran and it, uh, or, or, uh, and so on. My, my point is that this is not just a non-proliferation problem. But for anyone who wishes to see at present or down the road, rollback of some nuclear weapons program, the PRK for as an example, let alone disarmament regional or global, the fact that one could legitimately, or at least with limited opposition, pursue so many of those activities that bring you so close to a nuclear posture is a huge, huge challenge. So we have an ad hoc. Uh, um, um, so we have a, an ad hoc problem with Iraq, Iran. We have an ad hoc problem with the DPRK, but we have a much bigger problem from the proliferation and, and, and disarmament perspective. And that if we try to approach negotiations with Iran and the DPRK, in the hope of reviving the the diplomatic toolkit to actually cap those programs and roll back some of the activities of greatest concern, it's gonna be very difficult to do so unless we have a generic template that both legitimizes and, and, and blazes the path to, to, um, towards, uh, um, towards uh, capping some of those activities of greater concerns. So as a result, my, my conclusion is that what is urgently needed and here I turn to all the good scholars and future scholars and practitioners that uh, the Monterey Institute and the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies uh, cultivates with such zeal and excellence, which uh, I will, will, will reassure us that we have a future supply of people to engage in this field. The international community desperately needs new generic tools to discern and contextualize the developments of potential concern. And here, even if we can't get the general template, then at least we will have a technical capabilities to think about those issues and cry foul when absolutely necessary. And then to build a consensus around criteria to deem some activities unacceptable and develop around them the institutional arrangement to implement them. Let me stop here. Thank you.